and then uh I got it going all right sounds good all right, all right. Uh, and again like i said caitlin is a applied linguistics senior graduating in applied linguistics this semester she's doing a senior honors thesis with me which we will be hearing about on april 19th in person so do come for that uh, but she's also a great resource person to ask any question about linguistics. Um, so, you know, uh, feel free to ask uh, Caitlin about final project if you have any questions on that, as well as any questions on the midterm review. Thank you, Caitlin, again for joining us and taking over. All right. I will see you all on Tuesday, March 24th. All right. Okay. Good luck with your midterm. Happy spring break. All right, hi everyone, um, I'm Caitlin. Um, I am losing my voice a little bit. I uh, overused it recently and I actually had to go on vocal rest for an entire day. Um, so if at any point you can't understand me, please just let me know. And I can, I guess, type in the chat what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, but for your midterm review, we are doing sort of a who wants to be a millionaire <clears throat> kind of review. And um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I think that, um, do that just a sec. All right, do you guys see what I'm seeing? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so for each of these questions, um, I think that what we'll do is just have anyone say which answer, answer they think is correct and maybe a little bit about why. And if you disagree, then go ahead and um, say that and explain your logic. And then we can um, maybe vote on it, something like that. You will have three different lifelines in the game. The first one will eliminate half the questions uh, for a question that you find really hard, half the answers for a question that you find really hard. Um, the second one is a weird little phone a friend free feature that I experimented with. And it'll ask an imaginary audience what they think. <clears throat> And I guess it comes down to whether or not you trust this imaginary audience. In the time that I used it, it was correct. Um, the majority was correct, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be in the future. And then the last one, I think, is just a question skip. So um, let's get started. The first question is, uh, language system is unique because of the similarity with animal communication. B, it's not unique. C, combinatoric system it uses, or D, tons of memorized expressions or expressions that are memorized. So what do you guys think? Kelly. C, uh, do you wanna explain a little bit about that? <clears throat> um, well, I mean, I think that's what makes a language system unique is all the different combinations of phonology and morphology that it uses. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I think that that's correct too. And um, because, and I guess primarily a lot of the other question, the other responses don't make a lot of sense, right? Similarity with animal communication. Yeah, there are similarities, but there are also a ton of differences that you learn about, I'm pretty sure early in the semester. Um, but it's not unique. We know that's not true. Um, <clears throat> D, tons of expressions that are memorized. Um, one of the features of language is inventiveness. So we know that that's not true. So that does leave us with C. And is everyone fine with leaving that as our final answer? Okay. So we were correct. Awesome. Let's move on to the next one. What is a transactional language? Um, a, social relationships between participants. B, communication aspect of language. C, language for doing things, or D, language for transactions. <clears throat> if you don't know the answer right off the bat, if there are any that you want to eliminate, we can totally do that too, but just share your thoughts with me if, um, yeah, if you have any thoughts. I'm kind of leaning more towards A, but I am not mm -hmm. 100% on that. What do you guys think? I'm torn between A and B. Okay. <clears throat> I'm thinking B. You're thinking B? 
Okay. Um, is this one that a lot of people are maybe a little bit unsure of? Because if so, we can use one of our lifelines. Um, I'm going to go ahead and for anyone who wants to use a lifeline, go ahead and raise your hand. And if it's like more than half, then okay. <clears throat> or use like the feature to raise your hand uh, if your camera's off, which is also. Okay, so that's over half. So um, do we want the 50-50, the uh, ask the audience or the go ahead and skip? What do you think, ask the audience? Sure, let's, let's go ahead and do that. All right, <laughs> so a large majority of your audience said that C is the correct answer. <clears throat> How do we feel about that? I think so too, because like a transactional language, like a transaction is an action. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's yeah. more than D because that's very, very specific and not a lot of our communication has to do with transactions. Um, so I think in a more general sense, that's why it would be C. Okay, I think that is a great answer. What does everyone else think? Are we good? Okay, let's go ahead and let's choose C. And we were correct again, awesome. <clears throat> so according to the philosopher Pierce, which one of these is not an example of a, um, I think there was supposed to be more to this question, um, but which one of these does not belong is a better way of putting it. Let me know your uh, thoughts because, um, <clears throat> Yeah, so it's pretty much just one of those, which one does not belong. Kind They're all kind of synonyms for each other other than index, so. I was thinking B, but. I think, why are you thinking B? Let's go ahead and unpack that. Um, because the other three words I've heard a lot during lectures, mm -hmm. <laughs> but not figure. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any thoughts <clears throat> on those two answers? I agree with Kelly that it would be B. Okay, so uh, do we wanna go ahead with B? Great. And that is correct. Yeah, these other three are going to be ways that language can be represented, um, I guess, as forms of communication. Figure isn't one that uh, Pierce mentions. I'm pretty sure that's just one that's in your text. Um, um, okay, <clears throat> a word that can alter the meaning of a noun by appearing um, with it is called a uh, adverb, a classifier, a preposition, or a modifier. What do you think, Kelly? <laughs> I was thinking a D. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> Because a preposition mm -hmm. does not alter the meaning of the noun. Um, an mm -hmm. adverb, we know that adverbs describe the verb. Um, it's not like a classifying type of word, I, I wouldn't think. Mm -hmm. I mean, modifying, to modify means to alter. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think that's a really great way of thinking through this question. Um, does everyone agree that it should be D modifier? Or any other thoughts? Go ahead and share. Um, even drop it in the chat if uh, you disagree and we can talk about it. But I'm seeing a lot of agreement. So I'm going to go ahead and select modifier. Okay, so yeah, um, like I was saying, yeah, Kelly, that's a really great way of thinking through questions. Um, I can't say too much about your midterm. I don't know what it looks like. I know. Um, what mine was like, and I don't want to say too much about that either, just not to get all you in trouble, but um, that's a really great way just of thinking through a question of getting rid of anything immediately that looks wrong to you and then moving from there. So we know very clearly what an adverb is, what a preposition is. A classifier may not be so familiar, <clears throat> um, but we can guess what a modifier is, even if we don't know the definition of it. Um, something that alters something, something that modifies something, a modifier, yeah. I like it. Okay. <laughs> so what are the design features of language? 
arbitrariness, creativity, duality, or all of the above. Did we ever talk about duality? Because that sounds unfamiliar to me, but arbitrariness and creativity do sound correct. Mm -hmm. I, I, think would... that, I think I do remember hearing duality mentioned, but I don't remember in what context. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, let's go ahead and select that just for the sake of time. I like, I like it. Um, let's go ahead. That is correct. Um, so, and that's another really great way of thinking about it too. So you, you, um, you're familiar with two of them. You're familiar with arbitrariness and creativity, I believe is what you said, but you're not familiar with the last one. You're pretty certain that the first two are it. So all of the above is probably correct. It would get a little bit dicey maybe if it were, you can select multiple answers, but it's not. Um, so yeah, good test taking strategy. Okay, what sounds are produced by using both of your lips? Labials, stops, nasals, or bilabials? It's bilabials, right? Yep, yeah, um, that is, I'm gonna go ahead and select that. Um, Cause again, I don't wanna keep you guys over. <clears throat> because um, there are labial sounds that don't involve both of your lips. So um, bilabials is the more correct answer. Both are correct, but it's, it's the idea that one can be more correct. So you have like, um, you have certain uh, fricative sounds like and you're using, you're using your lips to produce those, but only, only one lip. Whereas you take like a sound like mm, or like b or p, and um, like the B and P sounds, those require both of your lips. Um, so yeah, good way of thinking through it. Um, let's go ahead. What is the correct syllabification for phonetics? This one might be better to, um, maybe you can think it through, maybe you can write it out. Um, but I know one thing that Dr. Menon recommends and something that can be really helpful is to transcribe it into IPA as well, to use a piece of paper. Um, for something low stakes like this, maybe not as much, but for your actual midterm, um, I think that that's a good thing to do just to make sure that you're correct. You know what I mean? Um, does anyone have any thoughts about which one that you think is correct? Sorry, correct. My voice just gave out a little bit. I'm thinking C. You're thinking C? <clears throat> do you want to go ahead and explain that just a tiny bit, why you think C? Uh, I'm thinking because uh, when I sounded out phonetics, it just mm -hmm. naturally, I think the word, or the word I would use is musically. Mm -hmm. That's just how I would separate it. So like if I was singing it, then I would separate it into those notes. So if I had wanted to have three notes per word, then I would separate pho into one, net into another, and then ticks into one more. That's just how I learned to do uh, syllables. So mm -hmm. does anyone disagree or are we all on the same page with this one? I'm seeing thumbs up and I'm going to select it. Okay. Yeah. So that is a good answer. Um, I'll break it down just a little bit. Um, um, but yeah, that's, that's uh, Trinity. That's a really great example of like phonological awareness. So the ways that we subconsciously break down sounds. Um, and so what we see here is we have phonetics. We have three vowels. We have the, uh, the, eh, and the, eh. <clears throat> And so we know immediately that we're gonna have three syllables. Um, that doesn't rule anything out here because everything here um, shows three syllables. But then from there, we want to identify possible onsets. So fo is an acceptable onset. Um, so is ne. Um, well, okay, so with, yeah, so ne is acceptable. And then t is also an acceptable onset. And since, uh, the sound at the end um, doesn't have any vowel to go with, then you'll just make it the coda of your last syllable. <clears throat> so moving on, in the compound greenhouse, the stress is on the, um, there is no stress, the first element, the second element, or the third element. <clears throat> the first element, I'm seeing people, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, let's go ahead and select that. I see a lot of agreement for that. Yeah, first element. Um, that's, uh, yeah. So with any, um, with any compound word, um, you know a lot of the time that it's a compound because the stress will be on the first element 
rather than um, any later elements. And that's just something good to know, um, something that may appear on your midterm, uh, something that may appear in later linguistics work, but that's a really great way in English, I guess, to identify um, yeah, compounds. And I find third element funny because there's a third element, but you know. <clears throat> okay, divide this word into the smallest meaningful parts. Demagnetizability. What are you guys thinking? I'm thinking D. I agree. Okay. <clears throat> We're all good. So desanitizability. Yep, really good. Um, so again, the smallest meaningful parts is an indication immediately that you're looking for morphemes. Um, so you've got D, you can't separate that into anything smaller. Magnet, you can't separate that into anything smaller. Eyes, can't separate that into anything smaller. Ability could be confusing for some people, but again, you can divide that into able and then the, um, the suffix itty. So I'm really glad that you guys caught that. <clears throat> and another confusing thing about the last one, maybe for some people, um, just look out for the wording so that you don't maybe um, use syllabification for something that's asking you to break up morphemes. Um, just a little tip. Okay, so identify the bound morphemes for uh, reassessable. And I guess first you wanna know what um, bound morphemes are, and then we can move from there. So what is a bound morpheme? Does anyone know? It's like the smallest <clears throat> unit of meeting that is bound or attached to either side of the word or... Yeah, so a lot of the time it'll be like, um, affixes, right? So um, any morpheme that can't act on its own, it has meaning, but it won't have meaning on its own. So how many are we seeing here and reaccessible? We're seeing two. Okay. So what are those two? Re and a bull. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You guys are going to do great. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Women tend to use uh, more forms of higher prestige than men, and this is called as covert prestige, formality, language change, or hypercorrection. So I think this is another one that'll just be like very dependent on what your text says. Um, this isn't really like something that I've studied a lot, so I wasn't sure. I kind of had to look up the concept of um, some of these. Um, <clears throat> but does anyone know off the bat maybe what any of these mean or have an idea of what the answer might be? I'm, I know we talked about like using language change when going from a more casual to a more formal setting, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if that would like, if you just use it naturally, if that would be considered a change or if it would be formality because that's describing what it is. Yeah. Um, so what you're talking about is code switching, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think that this would maybe fall under code switching or just language differences between demographics. Um, <clears throat> but I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, maybe we can like, maybe I can help you define some of these and then we can move from there. So, um, okay. So covert prestige <clears throat> is a like concept in sociolinguistics. And it's the idea that um, some dialects that maybe in like a larger, I guess, um, group may not be like, may not have prestige in that group, but then you go to a more specific language group and it has prestige. Um, formality, I think kind of has to do with the code switching that you're talking about. I'm not completely sure what that's referencing, but you know, um, you use different kinds of, um, you use formality, I guess. Yeah. Go ahead, Kelly. It's a, I, I believe it's like a form of language register. Okay. That, I was not 100% sure on that. So formality, I think is. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's go with that. I think that's right. Um, 
again, I'm not completely familiar with your books. So I'm just operating off of um, what's a my noggin, but, and then language change. Does anyone want to like um, elaborate on that? Because I have my own ideas. So I'm not completely sure how your book defines it. In the lectures, we talked about like um, you might use a different type of language when you're with your family versus in a university setting. Mm -hmm. so that's a conscious, conscious choice you make to change the manner of the way you speak. Perfect. And then hypercorrection. Does anyone have any idea what this is? Um, this is one that I actually do know a little bit about if you guys don't, so I can share. Um, hypercorrection is kind of a way of speaking that is, <laughs> we talk about like um, grammaticality, right? Um, and grammaticality has to do with the way that language is actually used. Um, <clears throat> but in like a more formal, maybe I guess, um, maybe like uh, academic setting, this would be considered ungrammatical or incorrect. Um, so um, like this would technically be like an incorrect or erroneous way of speaking, um, but, a, but a way that some people do speak. So um, um, saying like, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a good example for you um, so I don't confuse you. Um, so saying um, with I rather than with me, maybe, um, because you use, with the preposition you use me, with I, that is usually the subject of a sentence. Um, yeah, between you and I versus between you and me, maybe, that's a little bit better way of phrasing it. Um, it's a way language is used, but isn't actually correct. So um, what does everyone think? Which one do you guys think sounds the most correct? It's either B or C, I don't know. You think it's B or C? Okay. Yeah. I would say B because it's more of a description of how women <laughs> tend to use language versus a conscious choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we all fine with B? Do we want to use a lifeline um, since it's one that we're a little bit unsure about? Or um, yeah, what are you guys thinking? Anyone else have any ideas? Okay, um, how about this? Go ahead and either use like the Zoom function to raise your hand or raise your actual hand if you wanna use a lifeline or go ahead and don't if you want to just uh, select B for your answer. <clears throat> okay, so I'm seeing that. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and select B. Okay, um, so hypercorrection is, and we can actually continue the game, this won't be an issue. Um, but here, maybe, yeah. So it's also kind of, it's, it's also, I think, a sociolinguistic concept, but it's like, you're trying to sound maybe more prestigious, um, but in doing that, you're maybe using an incorrect form or something that's not completely grammatical. Um, and this is something that women uh, more often than men are likely to do. I don't blame you for not knowing this one because I just imagined that it was something just randomly in your text somewhere. Um, okay, which sounds um, in entirety are learned first by children? So go ahead and like, if a baby's babbling, like in the really early stages of babbling, what do you what do you hear? What kind of sounds do you think you hear? Before anything else, go ahead, Kelly. Well, usually, like a baby's first, they say their first word is mm -hmm. da da, like mm -hmm. da 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 or mama mama. Um, but prior to that, I don't know. Maybe vowels. That's I don't know. I'm. I'm thinking maybe vowels. Mm -hmm. um, Trinity, did you have something to say? I think you um, unmuted for a sec. Oh, I'm just agreeing with Kelly. I think it's vowels too. Okay. Is everyone good with vowels? Okay, I'm seeing head nods, so I'm gonna go ahead with that too. Yeah, so it is vowels. Um, 
And I, again, I like the way that you thought through it. Um, yeah, it is vowels. When a baby like really first starts speaking, you hear a lot of like, um, I'm not, I, I don't have the exact, exact stages of um, speech memorized anymore. Um, but just really like, really think when a baby first starts vocalizing, you're gonna hear like the ah sounds, you know, you know what I mean? Um, even, <clears throat> Maybe I guess when they're vocalizing, when they're upset, when they're happy. Yeah, it is vowels. Okay. <clears throat> Identify all the words that begin with a velar consonant. Uh, so my tip for this one is to go ahead and with any, any question like this, actually put it into IPA. You don't wanna confuse yourself and um, yeah or think through it in IPA. You don't even have to write it out. Um, but writing it out sometimes, you know, helps you um, think it through a little bit better and then gives you something to look back at and be like, okay, that's why I said that. Um, so the velar consonants are the ones where mm -hmm. your tongue's in the back. And so mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's cat because knife are both kind of on the ridge. And then rat, I, don't, I can't even feel my tongue on that one. But mm -hmm. cat feels like it's farther back. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like your thinking. And since we do have an entire, another one of these to get through, your class is out at uh, 1045, correct? I don't want to keep you over. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and select that. And that is correct. The other ones were trying to trick you. Um, knife and what, um, I don't remember, the ones starting with a silent K, um, <clears throat> those are trying to confuse you. But yeah, K, K and um, there's an N sound, which is like, um, it's a weird looking N <laughs> where that curls under. Um, those are all your velar sounds. So that's, yeah, that's just a question of, do you have familiarity with IPA? Um, so syllabify, demonstrate, and confusing. Does anyone want to give this a go? See. See? Okay. So straight, confusing. <clears throat> Everyone agree? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good work. Um, because again, uh, you can identify three different vowels in this one, three different vowels in this one. Um, then you want to identify um the onset. So um, the middle syllable here is a really great one to look at. Um, an N and an F sound together isn't an onset that you can have in English. Um, you can't start a word with oomph. That, do that doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> so you separate those. Just make um, F your onset, make N the coda of this one, and that's how you separate that. But again, a lot of the time, um, you know, phonological awareness and metaphonological processes are going to help you identify right answer, but knowing how to think through it is good too, I think. All right, this one is the last one. I think that there were supposed to be other answers um, because A, C, and D are blank. Um, but I actually didn't get this handout if anyone um, wants to talk. Did you guys not get this handout either? No? Okay. <clears throat> but um, if yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, if we have to pick from those four, yeah. I would pick B. <laughs> yeah, we're like, hmm, that's a toughie. Yeah, um, let's go ahead and see. All right, awesome. Okay, so good job, guys. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the second one. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think maybe Dr. Menon meant to send me those handouts, but we, but just didn't, and that's that's okay. I don't know if we would have had time to work through them anyways. Um, I'll send her a message after this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right, okay. Um, so I, I think we already answered this one. I'm gonna go ahead and select the correct answer again. Um, so I think it was put in there twice, but let's move on. All right, this is a different question. Uh, what is meant by metalinguistic knowledge? So our options are um, knowledge about linguistics, knowledge about language, knowledge about philosophy, and knowledge about logic. Um, <clears throat> 
It's either A or B. Yeah. Okay. So I think, yeah, you're right. Immediately we can eliminate C and D because um, metalinguistic probably has something to do with linguistics or language. Um, does anyone want to elaborate on which one you think out of A and B would be correct? I would think it would be knowledge about linguistics because that's a little more specific than knowledge about language. I feel like knowledge about language is kind of general, mm -hmm. but I might be wrong. So just the, any, yeah, go ahead, oh, sorry. at the same time, like linguistics, it, like so far, all we've talked about is language, not so much linguistics as a study. Mm -hmm. That's true. So that's back true. to the drawing board. <laughs> <laughs> Should we do 50 50 on this one? Do we want to yeah. watch, watch it give us A and B? <laughs> oh, no. oh, well, so there you go. Do we want to go ahead with? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it actually is um, knowledge about language. I'm pretty sure that's another one that your book will be really specific about. Um, but I think based on what I know, um, so meta metalinguistics is like self-referential language, which is why I would have selected knowledge about language rather than knowledge about linguistics. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, again, again, I like I like the immediately eliminating C and D. That's a good test taking strategy. I'll have a little bit more maybe to elaborate after this if we have time. Um, but I really wanna get through this just so you see these because I think these are similar to like your midterm questions. Um, name one evidence for the symbolic nature of linguistic signs. Form and meaning are not arbitrary. There are antonyms in languages. Numbers can be readily expressed as pronunciations and translational equivalents don't look similar across languages. And I think immediately some of these like make no sense at all, right? Um, <clears throat> does anyone want to just uh, jump in and say, I don't like that answer instead of I like that answer? Or if you already have solved it, that's cool too. But um, I think this one can maybe be a little bit tricky. I, I of, think it would I'm, be, oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I was just leaning towards D. Mm -hmm. And why do you like D? Because when you translate, between languages, mm -hmm. the words are arbitrary. Yeah. So I know that A is not correct. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there are antonyms in language, I don't think would be evidence for any symbolic nature of linguistic signs, but maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like these the right answer, but I, I've been wrong several times. So, <laughs> um, Olivia, did you want to add anything? How do you um, agree, disagree? I know. I was, yeah, I was thinking more that like none of those sound as familiar when talking about signs mm -hmm. except for A. So that's why I was thinking about that. But I don't know if it's that they are arbitrary or that they're not arbitrary. So, I mean, I, I don't have too much I don't remember much about the the signs and stuff yeah and that's like that's like in the really really early lectures so I don't blame you um but I do want to share that one characteristic of language is that it, it has arbitrariness so does that at all affect how you feel about the other answers yeah okay so I'm going to go ahead and select d because we like that one yeah um this one can be a little bit tricky it's a little bit verbose again it's kind of um one of those earlier in the semester questions. So um, could be a good one to review. This one is, um, this one's gonna be like a, probably um, just a terminology question. So verbs which can take only one object are intransitive, transitive, ditransitive, or active. <clears throat> okay, I, here, I'll give you a little bit. So um, we're learning about linguistics, right? So we can um, maybe look at, even if you don't know the answer, look at some of like the prefixes and maybe then kind of um, move from there. A lot of the time, if there's an answer that's completely different from the other answers, I, I tend to rule it out, right? So active is really different from intransitive, ditransitive, and transitive. I doubt that they would usually just give you the answer like that. So it's probably one of these. In transitive means not transitive, right? We can, in, in means not. 
uh, die means two. Um, and we still don't know the meaning of transitive. And then we just have the basic transitive. So if we had to guess, what do we think that transitive would mean? Anyone? I don't know. Okay. That it, that it can be. So if so, if we're talking change. about. <laughs> okay. So if we're talking about something that can take an object, um, and see, so yeah, we're talking about something that can take a singular object, and then we look at the other examples. Well, this means die, so that's two. This means in, so that means not. And then transitive as a base. What does that does that help at all? Olivia, I would say you, B. You'd say B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna select that. Yeah. So transitive means that it can take an object. Um, an intransitive verb can't take an object. A ditransitive verb can take two objects. And I, and I don't exactly remember what's uh, meant by active verb. Um, but I, I hope that helps at least a little bit. Um, could you could you give an example of like what do you mean by taking an object? <clears throat> Yeah, so um, you know how there are like direct objects and indirect objects? Mm -hmm. uh, ditransitive verb could take two, like an indirect and uh, a direct. A transitive verb could take one, and an intransitive verb couldn't take any. So, like, intransitive would be something like if you tried to say, I run him, like, that's not correct. You know what I mean? That, that sounds really weird. Um, right. Um, let me just look up an example sentence of uh, ditransitive, just so I, <laughs> just for the sake of time. Uh, Would ditransitive be like, mm -hmm. um, the boy and the girl eat? Well, um, so those are subjects. Usually objects oh. in English are gonna come after because it's subject, verb, object in English. Um, right. So ditransitive would be something like, I gave him the letter. So what did you give? You gave the letter. Who'd you give it to? You gave it to him. So an indirect object would be like, would be him and letter would be a direct object. And so gave can take two objects. Um, then take something like, um, I love him. That takes one object. You really couldn't say, I love him the letter, you know? Right. So that's the difference. Um, <clears throat> and again, it'll just be like a terminology thing, probably. Um, and again, um, if you guys have any like um, questions, maybe I can help out a little bit. Um, feel free to completely email me. I will drop my email in the chat before the end of this session, even about your final projects. I've done it before. Um, and I think that it's a lot of fun. So uh, name the two parts of language um, as a sign system, phonology and grammar, lexicon and sound systems, rules and grammar, or syntax and semantics. So um, we're taking language as a sign system, which um, immediately maybe helps us get rid of a few of these. So phonology would have nothing to do with a sign system, so we can get rid of that. Um, the other few could be possible. I just want to know what you think um, before I get too into it. I think it's syntax and semantics, if I am remembering correctly. All right, everyone's nodding for the sake of time. I will drop it. So it would actually be lexicon and the uh, sound system. Um, I'm not exactly quite sure where that is, why that is. Um, because I too would have ruled that one out. I probably would have said something like syntax and semantics or maybe rules and grammar. Um, so I think that this is a part of something in your book again. Um, one tip that I have for this midterm is like, I know that you're gonna have open book. We didn't have open book, so it's a little bit different, but definitely read the book. You're gonna find like a lot of answers in the book. And if you can kind of roughly remember where you read something, um, then that is such a good tool to have because then you can be like oh okay so it was here you have like a time limit right so um yeah read the book for sure um because even the ones in the lecture even the questions that come from the lecture they'll probably be based in the book 
yeah um that's always been really like um important to linguistics tests that I've taken so I just want to drop that um little uh fragment of knowledge what sound systems are, are what sounds are produced when your velum is lowered <clears throat> So this is just another one, like you just have to understand a little bit about anatomy of like your uh, speech. So um, plosives are gonna be a lot of buildup of uh, air and then a sudden release. Fricatives are, you know, a violent kind of stream of air. There's a point of constriction at one point. Vowels are gonna be really, really open sounds and nasals are gonna be sounds where sound is resonating in a different cavity. It's not re resonating in uh, your, um oral cavity it's resonating in your nasal ca cavity so um does anyone know which one of these the velum would have to do with i would say vowels because that one's the <laughs> widest open space so to make more space maybe your tongue's lower mm -hmm. but that's just a guess anyone else have any thoughts too or do we agree with vowels well I'm using the strategy that you said earlier. I'm mm -hmm. almost afraid to pick vowels because plosives, nasals, and fricatives are kind of in one category. And vowels. Wouldn't it be nasals where your velum is lowered? That is. So I'm going to go ahead and select nasals for the sake of time. It is nasals. Um, when your velum is raised, um, it's going to be up. So air can just move right into your oral cavity. It blocks off your nasal cavity, right? Um, but when your velum is lowered, then the air can't completely go into your oral cavity. It's going to resonate in your nasal cavity instead. So uh, yes, your velum has to do with uh, nasal sounds. Just keep that in mind. And um, yeah, I like the way that you thought about that, Kelly. I liked um, the attempt, Olivia, too, because you're really thinking about oral versus nasal cavity. And I, I like that. Uh, so what is the correct syllabification for this um, ex exponential? <clears throat> see, exponential. Oh, okay. So, um, so here's, here uh, is why it's B. So you take that second syllable and you're looking at possible onsets and you might already know this, but I'm going to explain it just in case. Um, so sp is S and P together is a sound that you can start off, um, you can start something off with. You can start a syllable off with, you can start a word out in English off with S and P. So you don't actually have to make that decoda of the previous syllable. So that's why that is that way. Um, next question, identify the bound morphemes in this sentence. The, the dogs were chased by the oldest cat. Um, earlier, we talked about bound morphemes being a morpheme that can't act on its own. It has to be attached to a root in order to function within language. So what do you think that the bound morphemes are here? Would that be D because like on their own S, E, D, and E, S, T don't have a meaning? Right, yeah. So perfectly, perfectly done. Um, and E, N isn't even in this sentence. So I don't know why uh, it was listed. It just, you know, just to trick you, but yeah, that is correct. Uh, divide this word into their smallest meaningful parts. Anti-disestablishmentarian. So again, meaningful parts. It's not asking about syllables. So you're looking at morphemes. B. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, and again, yeah, you identified all of these perfectly. Um, you can't separate est and ablish. Those aren't uh, meaningful. Uh, units. So um, in some languages, highly complex words may be formed by combining several stems and affixes. These languages are called, um, and right off the bat, we can probably get a, rid of a few of these, um, or maybe not. Um, Would that be B? Yeah, that's what I think too. You're thinking B? Okay, I'm going to select it. Um, the answer is actually polysynthetic, and I know that that's tricky because agglutinative languages also take a lot of, um, they take, okay, so in a polysynthetic language, you take a bunch of stems and affixes, and 
your verb and your nouns and your ad what have you will all be combined like through affixes in one big word that could convey an entire sentence, right? Um, whereas in an agglutinative language, um, you will still use a lot of stems and affixes, but usually they're gonna be a little bit more separated. I know that's tricky. Um, this one would have confused me too, for sure. Um, if I weren't studying an agglutinative language right now, that's my the subject of my honors thesis. Um, but yeah, polysynthetic. And I, I know the wording is a little bit tricky too, you know, I don't blame you for making that mistake. Um, in language variation studies, there could be a problem with writing down what you thought you heard. This is called perception error, observer's paradox, Labov's problem, or a methodological issue. <clears throat> perception error? I'm gonna select it. Yep, so if we know what like observer's paradox or Labov's problem is, if it hasn't been mentioned, and I say this very tentatively because if it's something that maybe you kind of recognize and you're not sure, um, but if it's something that's just never been mentioned, then a lot of the time, you know, maybe the simplest answer is correct. And I think that is the case here. Children usually admit which of the following sounds. Um, so here I'll walk you through it a little bit. Um, a lot of the time, you know, so this is completely different. A stop is, um, a manner of speech, these are like, uh, these have to do with placement, right? Labials, alveolars, velars. So I would look between these three. Um, and then from there, a lot of the time, which sounds do children develop first? You said the example of dada, uh, when they want their bottle, baba. Those are sounds in the front of your mouth. Those are labials and those are alveolars. So um, that leaves velars, you know, um, being in the back of your mouth. Um, and I would probably select velars. Um, does that make sense? I just want to be able to get through these so you guys have actually seen these questions because um, we only have one minute left. Okay, identify the segment that differs in place of articulation from the other three. So we've got mm, we've got p, we've got ol, and we've got w. So which one differs in place of articulation? C O. Yep, there you go. And okay, syllabify so discussion and congratulations. So, um, so we've got um, the middle syllable right here. So we've got di, that's fine. Um, we wanna see if we're gonna have a coda. So can we say sk at the start of a word? Yeah, we can. So we're gonna keep ska together and then shun, there's no other vowel to worry about so we can keep that together. Um, so we've got ka at the beginning of congratulations. Then we've got mm, like the end sound, there's like, um, and then there's like, um, we've got a velar sound and we've got this um, alveolar liquid together, right? So um, um, so we have to separate the N from the G and the R. You can start a sentence with grr, but you can't, um, yeah, I'm not gonna keep you over time. I will just let you know that I think it's- I was thinking D. You're thinking D? Yeah. Let's select it. Okay, cool. And then we don't even have the handout for this one, so we're good. Um, if you do perhaps find the handout, the answer is in fixation of in. Um, so yeah, biggest tip, um, make sure to read the book, make sure to review the book. Um, if you have any questions, my email is, um, you can look me up in the Wichita State directory if you like, just type my name. My name is Caitlin Hamburger. My email is kshamburger at shockers.wichita.edu. Um, I'd be happy to help you. Um, and yeah, I hope that this was kind of helpful um, I'd love to explain anything more if I confused you at all. So yeah, just let me know. Um, you're free to go. Uh, thank you for, you know, being so willing to, willing to participate in this activity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.